Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again. In today's video, my insane mother-in-law racked up over $500,000 in debt and then blamed us for it, claiming it is our responsibility to pay it off. Here is what happened. Let's dive right into the relationship story. 10 years ago, I married the most amazing man. Our marriage has been smooth sailing in every way and I have no complaints or issues except one. His mother. It's not uncommon for your spouse's mother to not get on well with you, but I swear she really takes the cake with this one. Because it is both me and my husband who are getting increasingly frustrated with her. She is not good with her money to say the least, from the first moment she could get a credit card, she has been in debt. She seems to not grasp the idea that if you spend money you don't have, you will have to pay it back. Me and my husband have tried to sit down with her countless times and speak to her about these habits, we know the consequences won't be good. She will end up with zero dollars in her retirement if that's where they end up having to claim the money back from. Anyway, each time we sit her down for a chat, she shuts down claiming that we are young and don't know what we're on about and you have no right to tell me what to do with my money. So let's just say it's not been an easy one. A couple of months ago, we learned the extent of my mother-in-law's debt when she rang the landline. I heard my husband speaking on the phone and one line got my attention. $500,000? I heard him say in a squeak. At this, I went over and I listened in. It was his mother on the other end. Yes, and I need you to pay it off. What? I remember asking in exasperation. Oh, good that you're here too. You and Mark need to pay off my debt. I cannot take out another credit card before they are cleared. We are not doing that, Karen. You got yourself in this mess. And yes, her name is Karen. It's your fault that my life is in shambles and as my son and daughter-in-law, you're obligated to support me. I stood aside in shock while my husband continued talking to her, telling her that we would not be doing such a thing and reminding her that we have helped her financially in the past and never got so much as a thank you. But obviously this was just too much and we did not even have that much money. And if we did, I think we would only spend it on her if it meant all of her bad financial decisions just stopped entirely. Mom, no! My husband Sai yelled through the phone before slamming it back on the holder. We had a big rant to each other then and he was really worried about her more to the point, angry. We did not know it was as bad as it was, $500,000, I have no idea how she even managed to get approved for all these debts in the first place and she had no history of repaying anything. The next day, Karen called around and said, you guys are being selfish. She had said once we opened the door, you need to care for your mother. We do care for you and have helped you in the past. If you ever needed a place to stay, we would be here. Food? Come over. But we are not enabling these bad habits of yours any further. I told her genuine worry on my face. They are not bad habits. What's so awful about shopping? You shop too. And yes, we shop, but we are not in $500,000 of debt. Listen, Karen, you need help. Not financial help, but like actual help. We will pay for you to get into therapy, but not your debts. Karen got even angry at this, saying that we were trying to embarrass her and that she did not even have a problem. Me and my husband glanced at each other with a she really does need help look, which angered her even more. Stop treating me like a child, she had yelled during her rant, tears practically springing from her eyes as she repeatedly begged us for the money. We stood in silence while she continued berating us for being a bad son and daughter-in-law and eventually she realized she was not getting anywhere with the guilt tripping and jumped to more extreme measures. If you don't give me the money and settle my debt, I will sue you both. What? Mom, you're being ridiculous now. Why don't you come in, lie down on the couch for a few hours and stop treating me like some mentally ill woman. I will sue you. We will not be blackmailed into paying for your mistakes. Come back when you realize you need help and only then we'll be willing to talk to you. Okay, Karen said, suddenly ten times calmer, which scared me. Can I use the bathroom first? Of course we let her and a couple minutes later, she was gone, driving off. She didn't say much more to us, which again, seemed a little bit odd. I brought that up to my husband and he agreed it was strange. We concluded that perhaps she suddenly had an idea of who else she could badger for money and gave up on us. Well, that is what we thought until a couple of days later when our joint card was suddenly charged $10,000 and titled loan payment number one. I ran to my husband in shock and he had no idea what it was about, so we rang up the bank. They informed 
informed us that a cardholder for the account had come in and signed for a massive loan. They said that they signed as me and of course they had no way of knowing that it wasn't me as whoever stole the card perfected my signature. Me and my husband knew who had done this of course, we just couldn't believe that she actually would do this. We tried ringing her multiple times but there was no answer, we went around to her house, nothing. We debated for hours about what to do and then we realized that there was only really one thing to do, it pained us, my husband more than me, to do it. We knew though for our own financial reasons and for her sake we needed to escalate things. We called the police and reported her for stealing our credit card and identity theft and we went over to the station to get everything finalized. And they recommended filing a restraining order against her too when possible to prevent her contacting us while this all went down. They warned us that it was gonna be messy, we were not involved for a good part of the process and only got updates. However, by the fifth day we got a call saying that they got the card back, they had found it in her home after having to search for it due to her lack of cooperation. She was sentenced to prison time and while we did have the restraining order, she did use her last phone call on us. Calling us selfish, horrible children of hers and then just screaming, what did I do to deserve this? We did feel bad, but we also knew this might be the only way for her to learn what sort of consequences her actions can have. She is not a bad person, just has really gone down a slippery slope when it comes to her finances. We did a full audit with our bank and it turns out that over the years Karen has been stealing from our credit card and taking out small amounts. It racks up to over $100,000 total and I really don't know how we didn't spot it to be honest. I guess because it's a joint account we both assumed it was the other person. Anyway, we were genuinely enraged by this because obviously this is impacting our life as well as hers and that's not even a debt, it's just plain old theft. We filed a civil lawsuit against her as a small claims court case. We know it's not really small but also did not want to make a huge deal out of it. As she was still down at the station and holding, she could not come but it wouldn't have mattered anyway as there was no way she would have managed to get out of it. We got the $100,000 back and also pressed to have her charged for rehabilitation during her sentence. Of course, the loan under our name was also revoked and the first payment of $10,000 was put back into our account. She got sentenced to several years and it would have been more but we didn't want to get her the max. She will be getting the rehabilitation we ordered during her sentence and once she is out we will be ready to welcome her with open arms, a decision many might judge. We've tried to visit her and so far she has not wanted to come and speak to us but we'll keep trying. We don't want to break this relationship forever and besides we just found out that I am pregnant. We want our kids to know their grandma and know her for the right reasons. And the next one is titled I 28 male kissed my daughter's friend's mom 30 female and I'm really happy about it. So my daughter is 6 years old and she met her new best friend at the start of the school year. Her mom is a very nice lady, they don't live far either so we have invited them over a lot. It's become a regular thing for the past two months to have them over every weekend both Saturday and Sunday. Either we take the girls out somewhere fun or we stay in watching movies and do other activities. I spend lots of time alone with her, we can talk for hours about anything and next thing we know time has flown by. Then the butterflies in my stomach and the blushing every time she smiled started hitting me. I have been a full time single dad for three years since my ex decided to walk out on our daughter. So dating has never been on my mind. They spent Christmas Eve and Christmas with us which led to them staying all weekend. The girls fell asleep on the couch watching Encanto and it was me and her up for another hour chatting. I had a little bit of wine in me so of course I blurred out that she looks beautiful right now and randomly out of nowhere in the end we kissed though so it looks like it worked out for me. My heart was racing so fast I'm pretty sure my whole face was red as hell because it felt so warm suddenly. We were both smiling like complete idiots and before they left she kissed my cheek and man I just wanted to pull her in. It's my first kiss in years with someone I feel really connected to. It has just been a great weekend, I'm very very happy. Update to the story, I cannot believe I'm saying this but I've got a girlfriend guys and let me tell you, as a single father who's usually way too busy to date or do anything, that's nothing short of a miracle. I asked her out and she gave me an enthusiastic yes. It was exciting, it was nerve wracking and we had dinner the following night without the kids. Gotta admit it did feel a little awkward, no kids there as a distraction and this was meant to be romantic. We eased into it though and then we just did not want the night to end. After dinner we walked around her whole neighborhood just talking until it was really starting to get late. She looked so beautiful I couldn't stop looking at her and then last night with the girls was I cannot even describe how happy it made me. 
We agreed not to tell them about us being together for a while and no PDA in front of them, so even if it was hard keeping our hands to ourselves, it still felt nice making dinner, watching movies with the kids and making a comfy pillow fort. They swore that they were gonna stay awake to watch the ball drop, famous last words. They were out before 11, the kids asleep and then it was midnight and we shared our first New Year's kiss. The best night I've had. We did end up getting carried away, but you know what, I don't care. It was amazing, we stayed up all night talking afterwards, chatting about everything, life where we want things to go, it's been a long time for sure since I had an intimate conversation like that with anyone, we sure as hell didn't regret staying awake all night when we woke up at 7am to the kids playing downstairs and asking for breakfast, already been a chill day today. I cannot stop smiling and for me this is what it is all about. Happy New Year's everyone, I'm definitely looking forward to all the possibilities. And the next one is a malicious compliance story. It starts like this. Near my former place of work was an excellent seafood place named Shelley's. Far better than you would expect from the average strip mall outside, they made amazingly good food like pasta, jambalaya, shrimp louis and lobster roll were particularly good. And lunch was reasonably cheap, usually $15 with tip if you stayed on the lunch menu. Unlimited bread rolls ensured that you would not go hungry and they were damn good too. One of the waitresses though, well, she could be a little trying. Must have been over 70, a former smoker, and she took two to three breaths to ask you, what do you want to drink? And a little hard of hearing, a challenge for my soft-spoken Australian expat co-worker. Anyway, she was a fixture. So you bit your tongue and you knew the chef would lay a little extra on your plate and sometimes even free dessert, Boston cream pie housemate, except the Karens, who complained and sniggered behind her back and went to the manager, also an owner, to ask to be reseated. Of course, let me show you the patio. Well, Jimmy and I exchanged a look because we know the patio is only open for dinner. 15 minutes later they stomped back in order to complain that no one came to take their order and they had to head back to the office and what was he gonna do about it? Most people take the hint lady. Speechless they sputtered and left, meanwhile our waitress wandered by with free pie and the check. Anything else boys? We're good Shelly, thanks for the pie. You boys be good, see you next week. And then she wandered off, still working in the restaurant she started 60 plus years ago and now run by her son, the manager, at the time of the incident. By the way, this was just before the pandemic, Shelly passed away from emphysema related problems, 89 years old working in her restaurant that she opened with her husband at age 19 and worked there for 70 years. Her son took over as manager but she still showed up to work every day, working the lunch hour, sometimes early dinner if she felt good. The wife and I celebrated many events there over the years including her telling me that she was pregnant after 3 years of trying and a miscarriage. Shelley was there for more than a few lunches and dinners, my mate from Australia chipped in buying her flowers for the funeral when I told him. The next one is titled Mega Entitlement. Gentle readers, tonight we shall speak of an entitled person trying to game the system only to be tripped up by their own cleverness. Buttercup, the emotional support unicorn, is in her paddock having enjoyed a delightful frolic in a summer rain shower. Feel free to towel her off. There I am, night shift at a hotel finishing up my dinner and some of the nightly paperwork when a guest rolls in. There is an aura of smugness to him, palpable and malevolent. He's gonna try something. I check my watch. It's 12.08 am. Yep. It's the classic after midnight early check-in. For those unfamiliar, some people will try and check in right after midnight thinking they can thereby get two nights for the price of one. After all, it's Thursday now, right? They will display deliberate or sometimes genuine ignorance as to how hotels work and insist upon being given a room. Well sir, check-in is at 3pm and… And I'm a shiny rock member. Of course he is. As I was saying, I may be able to adjust your arrival date. What was the name, sir? Karen. Okay, let's see. Um, hang on, keys clicking, not seeing it for arriving tomorrow. I emphasize this as all my arrivals are in and I haven't done the nightly rollover or as I call it hitting the make tomorrow happen button. Well, I made it two weeks ago, let me pull up the email. While he's doing this, I'm doing a quick, ha, huh, our system is slow search on his name. Ah, yeah, found a reservation and that's why it wasn't showing up. You made it for mid-November. Oh, ha, huh, my bad. Well, can you move it to now then? This man should not play poker as his tone is not one of someone who has made a mistake, but rather someone who knows full well what he is doing. I grit my teeth. Hmm, let me see what I can do. It looks like this was a prepaid deposit and 
You're not gonna charge me more, are you? I already paid and I'm a shiny rock member after all. Member or not, your humble narrator hates being interrupted. In case it's not clear to the non-industry folks out there, not only has he tried to score an extra night by checking in right after midnight, he has also booked a room two months out on the basis that they're usually cheaper the further out you book. The idea being to move the cheap reservation up to the presumably more expensive current night. He is hoping to beat the system in two days and I'm not gonna let him get away with it. However, he is a shiny rock member so I have to be nice about it. Fortunately, I noticed something. Well, sir, since you've paid in advance, the system won't let me alter the rate at all. Actually, I can, but it's just messy. But I've gone ahead and changed the date, so you check in tonight, staying a total of three nights and depart on Monday. What I don't tell him is that the basic BAR rate for those nights is actually $10 cheaper than the rate he paid for mid-November. In attempting to be clever, he has successfully charged himself an a-hole tax with zero effort on my part. The guest smugly takes his keys confident that he is somehow one without realizing that he really hasn't. His is a comfortable and warm fantasy world and I see no reason to dispel the illusion. Speaking of fantasy worlds, Buttercup wishes you all a wonderful evening. Take care and don't let the shiny rock members bite. And yeah, Ripe Stars, I'm curious, have any of you ever worked at a hotel? That job would probably make me crazy just because of trying to have to deal with so many untitled people in even just one day. I might quit after just the first day. Anyway, the next one is titled, Yes, Speak to the Manager. I worked in a telco call center up until recently for too many years, first on the floor and then as a manager, so I have many stories to tell, but something reminded me of this occurrence, so here I'm posting for the first time. Basically, we were initially a business sales only team, but then turned into the triple S team. Which means sales slash services slash safe, so with basically no training, the members on the floor now had to start taking the dreaded billing and cancellation calls. Then one lovely Monday morning, usually Mondays are the worst because customers have had the weekend to build up extra anger meter for not being able to call in, business team is Monday to Friday, one of my team members gets a call from entitled A-Hole, aka E-A-H. This team member is fairly tenured, knows what they are doing and very good on the phone comparatively to others. She comes up to me and advises that there is a customer wanting to speak to a manager, aka me, and now for some additional info, for those who have never worked in a call center, especially ones that deal with business customers, a good portion of them think they are the most important people in the world, demand everything done that day and speak to a manager every other call. Because of this, I have conditioned my team, an average 15 to 20 team members, to basically talk to them out of needing to speak to a manager, since honestly only one out of like 20 requests were ever valid. Most of the time they just want to hear the exact same thing repeated to them. So going back, this agent comes up to me and says he has an entitled a-hole whom asks to speak to a manager and you, aka me, will have a great time dealing with it. She explains that it's another typical customer who is demanding a refund because he's being charged for something he did not sign up for. Now, while that could be the case in this particular situation, mistake or not, this charge slash item is actually saving them a ton of money. See, our standard internet and landline phone packages include local and national calls but not calls to mobile. For mobile calls and some international inclusions too, you can opt in for a calling pack which is an additional $25 per month. She has tried to explain that why they don't make many outbound mobile calls to normally warrant this calling pack, which is what most businesses get it for, they seem to be making many and longish calls to some Indian destination numbers and also China. Me, you have tried to explain this to them, right? Agent, I tried to, but before I can get more than a few words in, he, entitled a-hole, cuts me off and says he knows how it works and they don't make mobile calls. And also that he doesn't have time to speak to someone that doesn't know what they are talking about and doesn't know simple math and how we are unethical for selling something he doesn't need. Already knowing where this is gonna go, and I do love maliciously complying to things, I jump on the phone. I jump on the phone and introduce myself as the manager and start the conversation by saying, or trying to, I've been advised of the situation by the agent, but please could you give me your account of the events? But before I could get out half of that, EAH cuts in saying that he has no time to spend dealing with our shady sales practices because he upgraded plan and transition technologies to fiber and that I should just refund the 4 months worth of calling pack charges $100 in total. After some back and forth of me trying to explain what my agent has tried to, all calls are definitely recorded and entitled a-hole cutting me off each time, I finally got a full sentence out very clearly. Me, you understand and accept that if I refund the calling pack cost, you'll be liable for all mobile calls including all, I emphasize that word in my tone, all calls made to international numbers. 
Entitled A-hole. Yeah, yeah, just get on with it. Excellent, I will have that done. Here's your reference number. Is there anything? EAH hung up the call. With a massively evil smile, I turn to my agent and tell her to credit the call pack amount, but also I'll be coding her for time off the phone so that she can work out exactly how much to charge the customer. Now, the system does not automatically back charge these kind of things, so it's actually more work doing so. But it's also in our TNCs that legally, if there was any invoicing errors, like customers not getting charged correctly at all, we are legally able to backdate up to 6 months of charges. I made sure she included the connection fee on top of talk time charges. I don't remember the exact amount, but it was upwards of around $600 to $700 after the $100 credit. Made ironclad case notes on the account about the whole interaction to make sure that when they called up next time they would get nothing. Which they absolutely did. Another manager who took the call laughed when they came up to me and had the pleasure of giving them the fat denied slap. It turns out they were making landline calls to suppliers and merchants overseas constantly and thought it was covered under a standard call because it was a landline there and not a mobile. And yeah, ripe stars, it is just so satisfying to see entitled douchebags pay the a-hole tax. And yeah guys, if you cannot get enough of my content, please don't forget to check out my podcast by searching for Ripe Stories on all major podcast platforms such as Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts. Furthermore, you can find bonus content by going to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube or by clicking the join button here on YouTube. For a small monthly fee, you will get access to dozens and dozens of exclusive videos you won't find anywhere else. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again tomorrow.